Good evening everyone and welcome to our first meeting of discrete time signals and systems. I'm Chris Ron Lucas and I'll be discussing discrete time signal representation. So for today's lesson, we'll be first defining what are discrete time signals and then we'll take a look at some examples as well as the properties of discrete time signals, the representation using mathematical functions as well as some common classifications for discrete time signals. Well, discrete time signals are signals that are sampled in time. Comparing it to analog signals, these signals occur at points in time, meaning they are discontinuous. So these are represented by functions of n, such as x of n or y of n. Now common discrete time signals are sampled periodically, as shown in the figure. So when the analog signal passes through a sampler, which samples periodically, we can achieve a function that is based on the integer multiples of t. t is called the sampling period. So in the figure below, we can see that xa of t, the analog signal, becomes a sampled signal, x of n, wherein the samples of the sequence are evenly spaced by integer multiples of t. The most common sampler is the sample in hold. And what it does, it, it holds the value of the signal until the next sampling period. So we'll have this staircase effect. So discrete time signals can also have discrete levels, such as what we call digital signals. And these digital signals are described in terms of bits or binary units. So the number of levels for these signals are determined by the process called quantization. So quantization is the process of mapping continuous infinite values into a smaller set of discrete finite values. The resolution of the quantization is denoted by the delta, which is r over 2 to the b plus 1 where R is the full-scale range, and B is the number of bits used. An example shown here is the mid-thread quantizer, which has a decision point at odd multiples of delta over 2. So when you have an uh, input value from 0 until before delta over 2, it gets rounded to 0, and when it gets to delta over 2 until before P delta over 2, it gets rounded to delta, and so on and so forth. So we have this error of rounding. So some examples of digital signals are the audio signals. For example, your WAV file which uses a PCM quantization using 16 bits and 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. You can load it in MATLAB and obtain these decimal values. Now, the sampling rate and the bit depth determine what we call the bit rate. And this is proportional to the file size that we have for our music files or speech files. So for 16-bit and 44.1 kilohertz, we can achieve as high as 1.35 megabits per second, which would mean 30 MB for a 3-minute song. Comparing that to a video signals, we have usually three layers for the RGB. For each layer, you have your resolution. In this case, we have a 5 by 7 matrix, each with 256 values, which means each of the pixels uses 8 bits. Now, these three layers comprise one frame and usually since the video is a moving picture you also have your samples in time denoted by the FPS so usually you can have 24 FPS and go as high as 60 FPS when you compare the bitrate to audio we can see that a 720p is almost five times as high as a WAV file. So at 5 Mbps, 
can also increase the resolution to 2K or 4K. At that point, you can have as high as 35 Mbps. And that's why for video signals, there is a higher need for compression. Now, some notes on quantization. So as I mentioned earlier, the resolution delta defines the error compared to our original input signal. So this error can be actually computed by subtracting the quantized signal to the original signal. And depending on our implementation, if we use truncation or rounding, we can actually minimize this error. So most of the time, these errors are classified as granular noise for the decoding resolution errors or overload noise for errors due to slope resolution. Most of the time, we observe this quantization error as a zero mean, uniformly distributed, additive, uncorrelated, stationary, and y, meaning it's uniformly distributed across all the frequencies. So aside from computing for the error signal, we can also we can also measure the quality of the quantized signal using the signal to quantization noise ratio or SQNR, which is defined as the 10 log base 10 of Px over Pq, where Pq is defined as the power of our error signal of our quantization noise, and P sub x is the power of our unquantized signal. So the power can be computed by averaging the sum of the squares of our error signal. Just to show you some examples, so if we have a quantizer for uh, 64, 128, and 256 quantization levels, and we try to quantize a sinusoid with a frequency 1 over 50, and we have 200 samples, so we can compute and compare the SQNR for each quantization level. For 256, and we use truncation, we can achieve 43.56 decibels of SQNR, comparing that with 128 levels, we got lower SQNR at 37.83 and at 64 quantization levels we have a low SNR of 31.53 decibels. So going from 256 to 64 gives you a total loss of around 12 decibels which is pretty high for decrease in SNR. Comparing that to rounding, we can see that the rounding achieves a higher SQNR. So at 256 quantization levels, we have 51 decibels. Comparing that to 128, we lost another 6 decibels at 44.48 decibels. And then at 64, we lose almost again 12 decibels, so the SQNR for this is 39.34 decibels. Now, let's go to signal representation. So most of the discrete time signals we encounter can be described by their wave characteristics, such as the amplitude, frequency, the phase, or the decay time. So in general, they can be mathematically represented using are elementary functions, or exponential functions, or sinusoidal functions. If you'd recall, these are our elementary functions. The unit impulse, denoted by delta of n, the unit step by u of n, and the unit ramp by r of n. And we also have the exponentially decaying functions, which is denoted by e to the n u of n, so depending on the value of a, for example, we have a greater than 1, we will have an exponentially increasing signal. If a is between 0 and 1, 
can have an exponentially decaying signal. If we have a less than negative 1, we'll have an oscillating and exponentially increasing signal. And if a is between 0 and negative 1, we'll have an oscillating and exponentially decreasing signal. So last but not least, our sinusoidal functions denoted by a sine or a cosine omega n plus phi, where a is the amplitude, omega is the angular frequency, and phi is the phase shift. So as shown in the figure, we have a cosine signal with an angular frequency pi over 6 and a phase shift of pi over 3. We can also use the alternative representation which is a sine 2 pi k n over n plus phi, where k over n is our frequency. And we can represent k over n as integer multiples of our fundamental frequency 1 over n, as shown in the next figure. As you go higher in k, you can have a higher frequency sinusoid. And the fundamental frequency here is 1 over 64. So there is a theorem by Nyquist which states that if the highest frequency in an analog signal is f max and the signal is sampled at a rate fs greater than 2f max, then we can still recover the analog signal from this sampled version. Not following this rule, may lead to what we call aliasing, as shown here in the figure. Supposedly, when we sample signals such as sinusoids, we want to cover all the peaks and all the points that represent the oscillation of the function. But if we use improper sampling rate and we don't follow the Nyquist sampling theorem, we can have this aliasing wherein this high-frequency sinusoid will be misidentified as a low-frequency sinusoid. In this case, the frequency is 7 over 8 hertz, sampled at 1 hertz. Ideally, we should have more than 14 eighths sampling rate. But since we use an improper sampling rate, this particular frequency will alias as 1 8 hertz. To show you another example, if we have x1 of t, which is a 10 hertz cosine, and x2 of t, which is a 50 hertz cosine, and then we try to sample both at 40 hertz, both will reproduce this following discrete time signal. So x1 will be cosine 2 pi 10, n over 40, which will lead to cosine 0.5 pi n, and x2 will be cosine 2 pi 50 n over 40, which will lead to cosine 2.5 pi n. And trigonometrically speaking, these two cosines are one and the same. So we'll see here that x2 will also result the same discrete time signal as x1. And that is what we call aliasing. On to our signal classification. So most of the discrete time signals can be classified according to their power or energy, the periodicity, or the symmetry. So we say that a discrete time signal x of n is an energy signal if the sum of the squares of its samples will result to a finite value. And we say that it's a power signal if the average of the sum of the squares of its samples is finite. For the unit step, since it has a constant value, when we do a summation until infinity, we get, we get an infinite energy, which means that it is not an energy signal. But if we get the average of a unit step for all time, we get that the average power is at 
If we have a complex exponential a e to the j omega n, it can be classified as a power signal since this oscillating function has infinite energy but it has an average power computed as a squared. So the unit ramp since it's always increasing, both the average and the sum of the squares are infinite. So it is neither a power signal nor an energy signal. So we also classify signals as periodic or aperiodic. So a signal x of n is periodic if and only if a shifted signal by a factor of n, which is the period, would still be the same as x of n. And the most common example for this are sinusoids. For example, a sine 2 pi f naught n, and f is a rational number. So we see that for every period, the sinusoid will be the same. As mentioned earlier, periodic signals or oscillating signals are classified as power signals. For discrete time signals, we also classify them based on their symmetry. So we say that a discrete time signal x of n is even if it is symmetric with the y-axis, or x of n is equal to x of minus n. And we say that a discrete time signal is odd if it is symmetric with the y equals x-axis, or we say that x of n is equal to the negative x of minus n. Let's try to classify these signals. Here we are given an aperiodic signal and it is finite value. We can imagine that the sum of the squares of each samples will be finite. So it would be an energy signal, an aperiodic signal, and since this is a symmetric signal with respect to the y-axis, it is an even signal. Now for the next one, we have a sine wave. This sine wave is periodic, and we know that periodic signals are power signals. And since this is a sinusoidal function, a sine wave, it is an odd signal. So it is a power, periodic, and an odd signal. In summary, we've learned that discrete time signals can be obtained from sampling and quantizing continuous time signals. And to ensure proper signal representation, we should follow the Nyquist criteria and also use proper quantization to minimize the quantization errors. And we also learned that we can represent signals using elementary functions, exponential functions, and sinusoidal functions. And last but not the least, you can already classify signals either as a power signal or an energy signal, as periodic or as an aperiodic signal, and also based on symmetry if it's odd or even. For further reading, I would recommend you to read the following chapters in our references. And that's it. Thank you for listening.